Good evening, everyone. This is a Shabbos which has two readings, Tazria and Matzorah, double portion. It also happens to be the second day of Rosh Chodesh, the first day of the month of Iyar, next month after Nisan. So we'll have two Sifrei Torah this week. And the Haftarah, the reading from the prophets, will um, be part of the um, Shabbat Rosh Chodesh. The Musaf will also be slightly amended because it's Shabbos that coincides with Rosh Chodesh. Now, the month of Iyar has a very special quality, different and more than any other month, this particular feature, and that is every single day of the month of Iyar has a mitzvah that has to be performed. Most months you have particular days, the days of Pesach in Nisan, yeah, you have uh, holidays that have specific uh, duration, a week or a day or two. But the month of Iyar has a mitzvah that starts on the very first day of the month and continues all the way till the last day of the month. And that is the mitzvah that we are in the process of counting, Svirat Omer. Every day we make a bracha. The month of Iyar has a mitzvah on which we make a blessing every single day of the month because it's in the middle of the seven weeks of the counting of Svirat Omer, which bridges Pesach and Shavuot. The month of Iyar also has an acronym. It's spelled Aleph Yud Yud Resh, and it refers to a Pasuk, a verse that says, Ani Hashem Rofa'echa. I am your God who is the healer. The Yud Yud in the middle it stands for Hashem, Ani with Aleph, Ani Hashem. I am God who brings healing. So may Hashem bless all of those who need healing, everyone to have a refuah shlema to be healed. This month is particularly associated with healing. We're going to go through a summary of the portions, double, two portions themselves, and then we'll go through some of the messages that we can hopefully apply in our lives. It starts off by saying when a woman gives birth, there is a process of ritual purification that takes place after birth. And the process includes the woman who has given birth going to the mikveh. It then says specifically when male children are born, there is a new mitzvah that relates specifically to boys. And that is there is a bris on the eighth day. We'll come back to this point, but it's very clear in the Talmud. It speaks about should girls also have a bris? There are certain cultures and religions that actually it's basically mutilate a, 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 a child, a girl child. But the Jewish opinion is that Kamahila Damia, a girl, is considered ready breast when she's born into this world. Her body is already after the breast. Not that she lacks the breast. There's no less element of the covenant of a Jewish child that is a girl, but she doesn't have to go through the process of having blood and having a, an operation, she's considered ready breast even as she's born into the world. That's a whole subject in its own right that many of the mitzvahs that relate to men having to master their own strength and their own spirit and to remind themselves like tefillin and tzitzis, all of the mitzvahs that try and put men into the onto the right path. So women naturally and innately have a greater affinity towards spirituality and need less time time orientated mitzvahs that are the reminders every single day to be on the straight and the narrow. And the same thing applies to bris. So what happens, number three, is that it then moves away from impurity that could come about as a result of childbirth, and it speaks about sarat. Sarat is inappropriately translated as leprosy, but it's not really leprosy because leprosy is a physical um, disease that needs to go to a medical doctor. And here we're telling us to bring whatever symptoms one is seeing to the Kohen. The Kohen was not a doctor because what we know about Saras is that it had elements that were similar to leprosy, as we know it, physical leprosy, but this was a totally spiritual disease. It indicated that there was a spiritual deficiency that needed to be addressed. And as soon as that spiritual deficiency was addressed, the external manifestation of it on the physical body was healed. So it had to go to a Kohen who diagnosed 
the symptoms because it wasn't a regular medical condition. And therefore, the word leprosy is probably a bad translation because leprosy has its own method of healing. But the tsaras was an indication that there was a deficiency, a spiritual deficiency, which we'll deal with in, in greater person, in greater detail. And then it speaks about it not only happening to the human physical body, but this strange um, this uh, discolorment and a, a seeming like a, a lesion was not only something that was found on the physical body, it was also found on their physical homes, on the stones and bricks of their homes. And that also had to be evaluated or on garments or on the person. In fact, we are told that it goes in that order. It starts with things that are much more external to us, the home, and sometimes we had to evaluate and see if bricks had to be replaced and removed and others had to be put in their place. This is like a manifestation, like a, a rising damp that happened where the actual bricks started festering. But again, it wasn't a physical condition. It indicated a spiritual problem. And if the person didn't get the message when it affected their home, which is most distant from them, it then started affecting their garments, which is much closer to the person. And if they still didn't get the message, then it actually started affecting the skin, the person, him or herself. Where did you take the... Um, symptoms to evaluate. You took it to a Kohen. We'll come back to why specifically a Kohen. And there were so many details that are listed in the Torah as to how one evaluates whether it is the kind of lesion that is renders the person to be impure, in which case the person is removed from the camp campment of the Jewish people. They have to go to an outside camp, removed from the congregation. And these details include the color of the wound, whether there was a hair growing in the wound, whether it was swollen, all of these things um, indicated to the Kohen whether it was, in fact, this ailment called Saras, the spiritual type of leprosy. What happened is that if the Kohen wasn't quite sure, so there was a quarantine of seven days, and then he reevaluated, and if, in fact, it was designated or seen to be this impurity of, of, of spiritual leprosy, it was then um, the, the responsibility to remove this person from the camp, and they went outside of the camp. They were sent outside, and we'll also discuss why that was the response to the spiritual ailment that we're dealing with. Well, what did it have to do with going outside of the camp? If it was on the garment or the house, you removed the afflicted area, and if it constantly recurred, then you had to destroy the whole garment or even the whole house. It wasn't being resolved by taking care of the particular stones or side of the house. It seemed to have affected the entire house or the entire garment. What happens is eventually when there is healing, there's a purification process. And this purification process for the person who was afflicted by the spiritual leprosy included two birds, spring water, an earthen vessel, scarlet red, thread a hyssop, which is a, a branch of, of, a, of, of a bush. And then there were various sacrifices that were brought, korbanot and also oil. So there was quite a specific recipe as to how this person would have these items used and administered. Then it speaks about other causes of um, spiritual, of impurity, of, 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 of lack of purification. So we talk Whoops, I'm sorry. Um, so it ends up talking about the various other situations where a person could become ritually impure. impure. We're going to go into some of the specific details relating to this and the messages that we can derive from it. The first thing that is discussed in the Midrash is Omar Rav Simlai. Rav Simlai says the following. We see that last week we spoke about which animals were pure or impure, because we had all the laws of kashrut. These are the kosher animals, the ones that are pure. These are the animals that are impure. This is what constitutes purity and impurity in the animals. It says Rab Simlai that immediately after that, we talk about purification of the human being. So first the animal and then the human being is defined as to what is pure and what is impure. And he says that's not a coincidence because the creation of the world, likewise, animals preceded the human being. 
animals were created on the sixth day before the human being. And right at the end of the sixth day of creation, the human being was created. So likewise, just as the creation, the human being followed the animal, in the laws that relate to purity and impurity relating to animals and human beings, the laws of the animal are presented first and then the human being. So why? And we've discussed this theme many times over Rosh Hashanah. We discussed it. Why did animals get uh, get brought into this world before human beings? And why do we teach the laws of purity relating to animals before we teach the laws of purity that relate to human beings? So we know that the Midrash tells us that there is there are two reasons why it is that a human being followed the animal. The one is a very humbling reason, and that is to a person to remind themselves that even a mosquito, a gnat, a, a creature that sucks the blood of others, preceded you as a human being. Even a parasite came before you as a human being. So don't get carried away with yourself. It looks as though you're an afterthought to even crude and simple and unproductive creatures that are in this world. And then there's another reason that is brought, and that is why is a human being created last? And why here are we teaching the laws of the human being after the animal? Because of a human being's stature. We were the purpose of creation, and therefore we came right at the end. Not as an afterthought, but because we are the purpose. Just like when you invite a dignitary to a important banquet, you don't have the dignitary arrive first. The dignitary arrives last because everything was there only because of the dignitary. The tables and the tablecloths and the settings and the silverware and the food and all of the guests, everyone is there for the sake of the dignitary. So he comes in last, they blow the bugles and they have the tararam and then in walks the purpose of the entire banquet. So the second reason given as to why a human being was created last, and here we're saying the laws of the human being are taught after the laws of the animal, is because, according to the second reason, we're the purpose of creation. And therefore, we come in right at the end because everything had to be ready and waiting for us to enter in as the most important VIP, the, the purpose for which the entire world was created. So two very different reasons why the human being was created last. Either an afterthought to a mosquito, so don't get carried away with yourself and become arrogant because you actually were created after even a parasite. That's the one reason. And the other reason, because we are the VIP, the purpose of creation. So which one is it? How, how do we now work out what is the reason that we came in late? Is it the one opinion or the other opinion? They're not just different opinions. They are the pole opposite. They oppose each other. One says, humble yourself to realize why you came as an afterthought to a parasite. Another one is saying, realize how important you are. The other, you are the VIP of creation. You came in last because everything was here for you. And Hasidus explains a great length that in order to know which one is the reason why we came last, we have to see what kind of life is being lived. If a human being is behaving like a parasite, that everything is for me and everything is here just to make me feel good, and to be a source of pleasure for my life. That's why the world is here. And I walk into the world and I have no respect for anything because it's all about my life and how I can be served. So that type of lifestyle of arrogance, we use the first reason as to why the human being was created last. We remind ourselves, don't get carried away. If your life is just being like a parasite, sucking and sapping, the, the, the world's energy for your own sake, then remind yourself how humble you should be because parasites preceded you. A mosquito came before you. But if a human being's life is about serving Hashem and is about connecting the world to Hashem and using the physical world for the mitzvahs that Hashem gave us, we use the animal hides to make tefillin and we use the candles to light Shabbos candles, and we use all the physical elements to connect them with Hashem's purpose and His formula for living, if that's the lifestyle, then we are the VIP. It's not about me. It's about the service of Hashem. And when we live a lifestyle that is in the service of Hashem, we become the connector of all of creation, of all the physical parts of this world and their source. 
the master of the universe, Hashem. We are able to connect the physical with the spiritual. So if we live that kind of lifestyle, we're the purpose of creation. And if we live a life of self-centered arrogance and expectations and, and, and demands for ourselves, everything is an expectation of what the world owes me, then we remember that we had mosquitoes come before us. That kind of lifestyle has to be humbled by realizing that in terms of um, parasites, we're not the first parasites. There were little parasites that came before us, long before us. Moving on to the whole concept of a bris. So we said that on the eighth day of a boy's age, child being born into this world, that is when he has a bris. The um, Midrash tells us that there was a quite a conflict between Yishmael, who was Abraham's son from Hagar, who was 13 years older, who was older than um, Yitzchak, and he had his bris when he was 13 years old. And Yitzchak, who had his bris at eight days old. So Yishma was constantly taunting Yitzchak and trying to show that he's more important, that he's better than Yitzchak is. And what he said was, look at my covenant with God. I did it when I was 13 years old. I knew exactly what I was doing. I could feel the pain. I could see the knife. I was involved. And it took much, much more Masirut Nefesh, self-sacrifice, for me to have a bris than when you had it when you were eight days old, when you were completely unaware of what was going on. You were too young to even witness or be aware of what was taking place. So Yishma was bragging to Yitzchak that my covenant is more significant than your covenant. And we've explained many times that Yitzchak was uh, not necessarily answering Yishma, but what do we answer to this? Isn't it better in certain cultures they do have a bris when the child is already a teenager? And, and we do it when a child is eight days old, when the child cannot understand or process what is happening. And we answer precisely that. The covenant between a Jew and Hashem is not based on our understanding. It's not limited to how involved we are or how much we care or how um, much self-sacrifice self we have. We do it to a child who's only eight days old because the whole point of a covenant is to say, we are marked even physically, for the rest of our lives, not because we understood, not because we were involved, but it transcends us completely. The covenant with Hashem transcends human rationale and human experience. It's something that Hashem connected with us in a way that transcends the faculties of a human being. And that's how it was with, specifically with a child, because it, it was wanted to be clear that the covenant of the bris is not related to understanding and to absorbing and to digesting and to living through the experience in a way that we're conscious. It's something that transcends us completely. And therefore, whether we like it or whether we don't like it, whether we're in the mood, not in the mood, whether we grow up and we, we feel frustrated by it, we can never really leave the covenant of Hashem because it was never based on our understanding in the first place. And this bris Takes specifically takes place specifically on the eighth day. Now, last week, while well, my YouTube video that I sent out related to the significance of the number eight, because last Shabbat was so interesting that Thursday was the eighth day of Pesach. Then we had Friday, the day before Shabbos, and the Shabbos was called the eighth day. So we had the eighth day, and then we prepared a day for the eighth day. The eighth day of last week's portion related to the setting up of the of the sanctuary, which was set up each day for seven days, but it was only on the eighth day that it remained standing, and the whole portion was called the eighth day. So we finished off Pesach with the eighth day, and then we went straight into the eighth day, and we spoke about the importance of the number eight, and I'm going to share what the Kliakar, one of the very beautiful commentaries on the Torah, where he speaks about numbers very briefly, because we've shared these thoughts before as well, that there is a process of three numbers that sequence one one after the other, the number six, the number seven, and the number eight. And the number six represents the extremities, all the possibilities of time and of place and of person. In time, we have six possibilities, the six days of creation. The world was created in six days. And in space, we also have six possible facets to any matter 
we've got breadth, depth, and height. That's three dimensions. And each dimension has two opposite sides. So they are numbered on a dice. You can actually see them. They're numbered one to six, all the extremities of time. And mystically, when we talk about human characteristics, which are very relevant to this period of time between Pesach and Shavuot, where each week is dedicated to another characteristic of our emotional uh, strengths. Um, it relates to Chesed, Gevura, Tiferet, Netzach, Yisod. These are six different faculties and emotions of our soul. And they all emanate from the six tools that Hashem used to create the world called the Sefirot, the mystical characteristics that Hashem used, um, character traits that he used to create the world. Kindness, and then it's pole opposite, which is discipline or severity. So we have all these different six different characteristics. So all the extremities of this world is either in time, in place, and in person is the number six. Then comes the number seven. And the number seven says that all of these six possibilities need to have a purpose, need to have a goal, need to have some kind of inner space that gives meaning and value to the six possibilities of time, place, and person. So in time, Hashem although he completed the creation of the world in six days, he then gave us a seventh day. And he said the seventh day is the purpose of creation, is the goal of creation. Every single day when we say the psalm of the day, we say, Hayom Rishon La Shabbos. Today is the first day toward Shabbos, the second day toward Shabbos. The whole week we're counting toward Shabbos. Shabbos is a spiritual uplifted time, spiritually uplifted time, which is the culmination of the six days and gives meaning to all the six days. So the number seven brings sanctity into the various extremities of time. There are six possibilities in time. The seventh dimension gives sanctity, purpose, and value, spirituality to the six possibilities in time. Likewise, in space, when we go into a sukkah, we surround it from six sides. Or when we shake the lulav in six directions, north, south, east, west, up and down, each time we bring it to our heart. Because the inner space of the box that has six sides is what is this box for? What does it hold? What's inside? What's the meaning of this box, of this um, numbered six sides? Six sides of what? And when it is a box that contains something that is meaningful, that is the seventh dimension giving credibility, purpose, value, goal to the six possibilities in space. And then we have the six characteristics of a human being is followed by the seventh, which is malchus. And sovereignty, which is the seventh characteristic, which will be part of the seventh week between Pesach and Shavuot, Clearly, in, in Kabbalah, it says Malchus doesn't have a characteristic in its own right. It doesn't have a color. It doesn't have some kind of um, description of what characteristic it is. It is the conveyor. It is the communicator. It is the connector of the six possible characteristics to be able to impact on whatever we are dealing with in the world outside. Again, the number seven wasn't an additional dimension in time, space, or person, but it was the depth of meaning, purpose, spirituality, sanctity that is brought into the six, and that's the number seven. And all of this is to highlight the significance of the number eight, because the number eight is of a different realm completely. It is a transcendent number. It moves into another octave completely. In music, we have the seven notes, but the eighth note doesn't mean just a note beyond. It means we've moved into a new octave, a completely new realm. The number eight is not sanctity in the realm of the natural world. It is transcendent of this natural world. The number eight represents a leap completely beyond. And therefore, the eighth day of Pesach is the day that we talk about the future redemption, which is a miraculous time when the world will be completely redeemed forever with the coming of Mashiach, supernatural, that's the number eight, circumcision takes a place on the eighth day because it's not about my understanding and even infusing my understanding with sanctity and spirituality, that's the number seven. The number eight means I'm connected to something that transcends me completely, that's the number eight, Hanukkah, 
is not like the other festivals, seven days long, eight days long, because again, it transcended completely the flame that should have burnt only for a little bit, continued burning. It was a transcendent miracle. So these are the numbers six, seven, and eight, and the important. Now, one more thing about bris miller, which, which should be driven home, particularly for men. One thinks that a bris takes place when we're eight days old, and that's it. It happens once in our life, and it's over. There is no bris for the rest of our life. Or well, the only bris that we have is the fact that our body still carries the mark of what happened to us when we were eight days old. But again, mystically and kabbalistically, there's so much that is written about a man having to have the concept of bris in their daily life, every single day for the rest of their life. Bris is not only the physical operation that relates to a limb or a part of the body, but it is a spiritual lifestyle where our moral code and our commitment to morality and living up to a relationship with a wife that is pure, that is committed, that is not just um, a, a flippant um, uh, utilization of, 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 of one's uh, sexuality, but it's something that is really holy, that is bris every single day of our life. Our physical bodies are marked when we're eight days old, but from then on, every single day of our life, we have a responsibility to live up to the bris, which is this higher form of lifestyle and moral code that the bris um, represents. Moving on to Saras. Now we've got the spiritual leprosy, which now we're going to get an insight from the Gemara, which tells us that why did the person get the spiritual leprosy? Something was wrong. Something was wrong spiritually. What was it specifically? And we know that it relates to Lashon Hara, to a negative tongue that speaks negatively of another human being. And we know how people normally introduce Lashon Hara. When they're about to say Lashon Hara, they say, um, I know this could be, you think it's Lash, but it's not because it's true. Now, nothing could be further from the truth because Lashon Hara is about something that is true. Somebody happened to do something wrong, but you're repeating it to a third party, to another human being, is Lashon Hara, even if it's true. So saying uh, it's not Lashon Hara because it's true is absolute ignorance because there's another word that is used for negative talk that is fabricated. That's called Motsi Shemra. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a different sin maybe a harsher sin, that you badmouth a person, you cause them um, a, a bad reputation for, for not even having the facts. The facts are, are fabricated. But Lashonara is when it's true, but you have no reason to discuss it with somebody else. Why are you talking about another human being? So Lashonara, we are told, is very, very serious. We saw that Miriam, who spoke negatively about her brother, Moshe Rabbeinu, on, a, on an occasion, immediately fell to the illness of leprosy. In fact, she was sent outside of the camp. I'm saying in parentheses, this is a very special message um, about Miriam, that the whole camp waited for her for seven days. They didn't travel those seven days because they waited for Miriam to go through her seven days of isolation, after which she was able to re-enter into the community and go through the stages of purity. And the, the Gemara says so beautifully, why did Miriam merit that the entire people waited for her for seven days? And the Gemara says, because Miriam, remember, waited alongside her little brother, Moshe Rabbeinu, when he was cast into the water, when the decree was that every male child should be killed and he was put into a floating basket on the water and Miriam stayed behind to watch over him. Mida connected Mida, Hashem repays us measure for measure. So Miriam, who waited for her brother, now being punished because she said something negative about her brother, the whole Mene Israel waited for her. Such was the righteousness of Miriam. So what happens is, as Miriam had this situation, any person who, as a result of Lashon Hara, talking negatively about somebody else, and thereby now is dealing with Saras, the spiritual leprosy, part of the process of this person being healed and coming back into the community and being purified was that this person had to be removed completely from the camp and be isolated. So the Gemara tells us 
And why isolation? Because the person who talks Lashan Hara causes isolation. When we talk negatively about another human being, we isolate that person from other human beings. We, we defame them. We cause them harm by making them feel removed from society. They feel inhibited. They feel sad. They feel isolated. They feel so, so much pain because they are being discussed among others, and therefore they feel isolated. And again, measure for measure, in order to resolve and to fix a situation where you caused another human being to be isolated from society because you spoke so negatively about them, the method of resolving it is for you yourself, for that person themselves, to experience isolation. They had to go into a camp outside of the camp of the Jewish people and be completely alone. They then felt what they had caused to another human being so that they could then understand the extent of their mistake. And that way they could begin the process of healing. And this relates to a husband, to a wife, to a neighbor, to anyone who causes hardships and pain to another human being by discussing a human being with other people causes isolation between husband and wife, it causes distance between neighbors, between all relationships. The answer is that person who caused that isolation has themselves to experience isolation, the pain of being alone. And just to stay on the theme of Lashon Hara, in Tehillim we actually speak about Lashon Hara as a chetz, like an arrow that flies. And there are many different explanations as to why Lashon hara, talking negatively about another human being, is like an arrow. So one of the commentaries says, like an arrow, not like a knife, that a person is using a knife in warfare and, and having to defend themselves with a knife. Your only way that you can um, cause damage to another human being but with a knife is by holding the knife, God forbid, and, and causing harm. So the impact is in the immediate surrounds of the human being as far as our hands can reach, but an arrow, an arrow utilizes the tension of the, of the string or the wire on the bow that then launches the arrow and it affects things very far away. An arrow or a rocket today or a bullet, the, the, the arrow was the forerunner of the rocket. You pull this way and then you cause uh, um, the, the energy to, 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 to enter into the, the projectile and it reaches far away. Why is Lashon Ara con compared to an arrow? Because when we talk Lashon Ara, we say just in between, you no know, one person says, don't tell anyone, I'm just telling you because I, you're my friend and I'm just telling you and it's just in the room. And before you know it, once you've started this bad information about another human being, it spreads like wildfire. And before you know it, it's on the other side of the world. Never before have we seen it as we see it in our generation. Because in one moment, a person can make a post on a WhatsApp or on a um, Facebook page. They can send an email. And in a second, it can go viral. It can suddenly be in the, in the hearts and in the minds of thousands or millions of people. That is how fast things travel. So Tehillim said, Lashon Ara is like an arrow. It's not, not only, doesn't only affect people around you. Before you know it, it travels so far, so fast. That's the problem of Lashon Ara. Second explanation is that just like an arrow, once you shoot the arrow, you can't regret and say, oops, oops, I shouldn't have shot it. I'm going to pull it back. There's no pulling back. It's no longer in your grasp. Once you launch it, it has its own energy and its own flight um, path, and it will reach somewhere way, way beyond. So the second added dimension to an arrow being compared, or Lashon Hara could be compared to an arrow, is that once you throw it, once you launch it, it is beyond your power to retrieve it. You can't just fix it anymore by simply saying, whoops, I don't, I, 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 I uh, negate what I said. I, I withdraw the comment that I made. You can't withdraw it. You can say in a court of law, I, I withdraw what I said. I regret what I said. I, 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 I want it struck from the record. I didn't say it. 
once you've said it, it's beyond your domain to control it. As the Chofetz Chaim once so beautifully um, described, when somebody came to ask the Chofetz Chaim for a method of fixing the fact that they had spoken negative talk about another human being, the Chofetz Chaim said to the person, bring me a cushion from your home, a feather cushion. And he, he said, go out into the wind on a windy night and pull out the seam that keeps the pillowcase closed and let the feathers fly and let the wind carry the feathers. And he did, he shook out the feathers out of the out of the case, out of the pillowcase. And then the Chavot Chaim said, now go and retrieve the feathers. So we all know. It was wonderful once they were locked up inside the, the pillowcase. But once you pull out the seam and they're flying all over in the wind, it's going to take years, if at all, to bring back all the feathers. So it is with Ashon Hara. Once it leaves your tongue, it's like a feather pillowcase, which then has the spread of the this disease, this, this terrible negativity that goes way beyond your reach. And you can't just withdraw it. You can't pull it back like an arrow can never be pulled back. And then the Gemara says that Lashon Hara actually kills three people. The speaker, the listener, and the person about whom you were speaking. That's what the Gemara in Arachin says. So we know why Lashon Hara kills the speaker, because he's doing a terrible sin. The listener is facilitating the speaker, and therefore he's equally involved in the sin. So we know why they are harmed. But why would the Gemara say that the person about whom they're speaking is also killed. I mean, certainly he didn't do anything wrong or didn't, uh, in the act of Lashon Hara, he was not only passive, the listener is not so passive because he's facilitating the person speaking. A listener could say, I don't want to hear, don't say. He could cut a conversation. So, and the fact that he doesn't makes the listener active. But the person about whom they are speaking who might not even be in the room, how does that person get damaged? And the Rebbe speaks at length about the adverse effect and the consequences of highlighting negative things about another human being, and conversely, the tremendous benefits and the consequences of those benefits when one talks positively about another human being. When you take a person and you discuss and you label and you say this person is, a, is, a, is bad in this area, is very deficient in this area, all that you're really doing is you are highlighting a weakness, you are discussing a weakness, and that weakness becomes into focus, and it becomes much more pronounced. If you want to give therapy to a child who has a deficiency or a weakness, the last thing you want to do is to tell the child, you're terrible, look how bad you are, you have all this weakness, and, then, and, you, and, and, and you're bad and you're negative. Of course that child will live down to however we label them. But when we talk positively and we speak about the, the strengths and we find the strengths in a child or in any human being and we describe the strengths of that person, the person rises to that. The person actually develops into to fill the shoes of what you have depicted the person as. So this is a very positive, important message that we have. When we talk to another human being, when we describe their strengths, they live up to them. When a, when a shulach is collecting money from a wealthy person, he begins by telling the person, you are the source of tzedakah. You have affected so many charities. You have affected the world in such a positive way. You're so generous. You're so kind. The more you describe the strengths, the more the person is more likely to live up to those strengths. And when you tell a child or whoever it is, these are your negative traits and these are the problems and these are the, the deficiencies and these are your weaknesses. And we talk about the weaknesses the whole time, whatever context we're saying them, it causes a person to live down to whatever negative element you're describing. And that we learn from this whole process of, of Lashanara, affecting the person about whom one is talking. We actually affect that person because by bringing negative energy about the person into the world, we actually highlight their negativity and that causes the person to, to direct their life in, in, in that direction. So this is now a beautiful medrash that speaks about the fact that there was a benefit that came out of the process of Tzaras. And the medrash tells us that when we came into the land of Israel and we took over homes from the Ammonites 
and the people who lived in those homes previously, they didn't want the Jewish people to find their gold and their silver, and they ran for their lives, or they were killed. So they took, they, prior to that, they took their gold and wealth and their silver, and they hid it, they made hollows in their wall, and they cemented it and painted it over so that the treasures, they thought maybe they'll come back one day to find it, at any rate, they didn't want the enemy, the Jewish people, to find it. So they hid the treasures in the walls of their homes, says the Midrash, which Rashi quotes. And then when a person started having these lesions on the bricks of their home, and they went to the coin, the coin said, you know, no good. We have to pull it out and then open up. And they started removing bricks. They suddenly discovered these uh, um, ga gaping, um, uh, um, hidden places within the walls that were filled with all of these treasures. That's what the Midrash tells us. And the beautiful message about this, I th you, you've probably heard it many times from me about the story of the Shamash of Helm, that once upon a time there was a Shamash who uh, tried to service the community and the simple task that he had was to be the beadle, the Shamash who, who was in the kitchen when the deliveries came from Moishis or from uh, whatever on, on Erev Shabbos on, on Friday. And on one occasion, this very simple person who had a very simple role in the shul be the shamash one time when they delivered there was nobody else to sign for the delivery and the poor shamash had to sign himself and the embarrassment that he felt when he had it to to to, to let on to the fact that he didn't know how to sign his name he'd never learned how to write so the people of helm got together to discuss the fact that they have a shamash who doesn't know how to write he's ignorant he doesn't have the ability to communicate by writing, so therefore he has to be summarily dismissed. He's not worthy of being the Shamash of Helm. And they fired him. And the story goes that he went outside and he started selling uh, uh, meager possessions that he had, and he actually had a, a, a strong ability in, in, in business. And before he knew it, he was like borrowing and buying and selling, and he hired another guy to stand on the next corner, and then he had people working for him, and he developed rapidly into being a very prominent business person, making a fortune of money, and eventually spread his wings and to other cities and other provinces and other countries. And now he became this absolute magnet, this incredibly powerful business person who controlled whole areas of finance in the country. And he had many people that were his secretaries and the people. But one particular board meeting, they passed down the documents to be signed. And he looked around for all of his mashosim, all the people that normally surrounded him to help, assist him and to help. They went there for the second time in his life. The poor ex-Shamash of Helm, this very wealthy business person, had to reveal he doesn't know how to sign his name. Ooh, you don't know how to sign your name, they said. Can you imagine you've become this incredibly powerful person and such a rich and wealthy business person and you don't know how to sign your name? Can you imagine what you would have been if you did know how to sign your name? He said, yeah, I would have been the Shamash in Helm if I knew how to sign my name. And the story only highlights that sometimes a deficiency and a weakness allows for possibilities of growth and opportunities of development that we would never have realized we were stuck. We might have been the Shamash of Helm all our lives. And the fact that we had a weakness forced us to develop the and, and find strengths that we might never have known that we had. And all of this is indicated by this beautiful Medrash saying that although there was a problem, and the person spoke Lashon Hara, and the person is being punished, and his, his home was uh, uh, had to be opened up and certain parts of it destroyed, he found hidden treasures. He found wealth that he would never have known that he had in his wall had he, didn't, had he not gone through the problem. And this is a general attitude that Yiddish guy, Judaism, and Torah has. If we go through a problem, if we have a failure, if we fall, if we've really been through a rough time of negativity, why? Why do things happen to us? Why do problems happen to us? Hashem never, ever wants it to be to undermine us and to pain us and to cause us to be lost. He's giving us the opportunity to look at ourselves and to discover a strength in ourselves that we would never have discovered had we not failed. The fact that we fall, when we pick ourselves up, we stand much stronger than we were before we fell. We've discovered 
a strength in ourselves that we would never have known. And this is a beautiful attitude in dealing with taras, spiritual leprosy in this week's portion, but it actually relates to all the things that we go through. We go through a painful negative experience. The question we have to ask ourselves at the end of it is why? How am I going to utilize this painful experience as a growth, as a development, as reaching a newfound wealth inside of myself that I would not I would never have known about had I not been through that situation in the first place. It kind of brings us to the end of the time of the share. So thank you so much for joining. I'm going to stop uh, sharing and wish everyone a beautiful Shabbos and a good Chodesh, a beautiful month ahead that is uh, filled with healing. As we said, the month of the year is specifically re related to healing. May Hashem bring healing to everybody. Thank you. Amen. Thank you, Max. Thank, thank, you, thank you, Chava. Nice to see you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Rabbi. Thank you, Rabbi. Have a good time. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye, -bye. Bye.